we could easily afford to, we, let's say easily afford, we, we could lose a couple and still be fine in terms of our numbers. Um, we, we sort of, we have a few sort of house rules. I mean, you know, I mean, one of them is obviously we're fairly friendly and supportive. Um, we tend to, you know, in terms of muting, et cetera, you know, we tend to, uh, we, unless you, you know that there isn't going to be much background noise or any background noise, then obviously it's sort of prudent to, to, to mute yourself. Excuse me. Andy, you muted me, mate, in, in mid flow. Okay. Um, good. Um, yeah. Um, we have a four minute rule, basically. Yeah. Um, and if people go 20 seconds over, we're not going to fall out with anybody. But as I say, I mean, it's a bit of courtesy. I mean, we worked out that four minutes enables you to have a good length poem or, you know, a couple of two or three medium length poems. Um, it, uh, you know, read at a decent pace. Also, you know, about 500 words of prose, you know, a couple of 200 word uh, flash fiction stories, read at a decent pace, okay? Let your words do your talking for you, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, finally, um, um, yeah, the technology, just use the technology, put links up in the chat and links to your publications, to your websites, and, you know, please feel free to do that. And um, okay, without without further ado, then I've, I've got a bit of a running order. Um, I was going to put um, James on first, James Ridgely. So if you want to come and James, if you if you can hear me, if you want to sort of show yourself, mate, there you are. That's great. Yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry, Steve. I was just finishing dinner. I didn't think you wanted to uh, see me no. in action. No, yeah. it's all right, I mean, do you want to you finish if you want, or put you on set and the third? Uh, no, no, no. You um, no, I, I can do it, and then I can enjoy the rest of it uh, and rest of it with my food. But thank you. <laughs> all right, then, no problem. So we've got James, then we've got Zoe, David, and then uh, Gordon Zola. I'm looking at technology as well. So I know some people get forget a little bit of either. So what I'll do is I'll um, I'll put up a running order for the first half, and then. You know, we'll do the second half after. You know, as, uh, uh, I'll do the second half at the break. If anybody's desperate to go, let's say the first two people are going to be James and Zoe, and then the third one, David. If anyone's that needs to come to go first, just 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 put it on the chat, yeah, or in or or my own chat. Okay, then. So the first person is 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 James Ridley. I know James. I think you're, are you from Oxford, James? Are you, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm from Oxford, born yeah. and raised. Yeah, quite a few of us went to Oxford. We were here. Oh, really? So, oh, cool. I don't want you to feel intimidated, though. You okay? Um, no, I'm <laughs> no, no, we townies now deal with, deal with you, um, are you people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, welcome back, James. Good to see you again. James Grizzly. Thanks, guys. So the first uh, poem I'm going to read is called An Experiment in Symbolism. The curve of the hourglass is something I admire, and as the time it trickles through, I feel the more desire. The jewel within your crown are your sapphires blue. And when you turn them on me, I know you see right through. Your shimmering waves of gold often shine so bright. And I have to bite my lip when it catches the light. But there is a secret way where I would spend my toil and nestled in a deeper place is a marble in hot oil. So please don't get confused on this symbolic tour because all I really want to do is give La Petit more. So this is not a bad attempt. And nothing's come unstuck, but for all these fancy metaphors, I'd rather just say fuck. Thank you very much. Um, so the second one is a breakup poem. So all of the poems that we that, are, that I've heard so far on Speakeasy are very different, and this seems like quite a sort of stereotypical theme, but since no one else has read one in the last two sessions that I've attended, I thought I'd give my attempt. So I'm doing better, I'm practicing self-care. I'm making good decisions now that you're not there. Myself I have forgiven for how I did you wrong. 
for in the three months prior, my support for you was strong. And through my introspection, I know that you were wrong for me. It took a bit of time, but now I finally see you were just a projection of my desires manifest. You did choose to play the part of my emotions you did test. You would choose when we meet to keep me lying at your feet. And I understand why it's important for you to keep control. So often in the past, your agency was stole. I do now understand it was a sexual transaction. I would give you love and praise and you would give me action. But even in a friendship, there should be parity. You did so take advantage, that I finally see. But you were not dishonest if I could just observe. And if I could see with your complexity and my harshness not deserve. For your emotions are so damaged, but I do believe they're there. And while you could not reciprocate, I know that you did care. Holding space for you, it really took my all. It was so exhausting and to old habits I did fall, but I cannot be too harsh for your focus on yourself and I can hardly blame you for your mental health. So I'm moving on with what's best for me. I do have some regrets and some clarity and I do now know it's better off this way, but I must admit, I still miss you every day. Thanks, guys. That's everything from me. Thanks for that, James. Thanks for kicking us off. That's a good way to start. Um, enjoy the rest of your meal. Stay with us, yeah? Okay. Yeah, no, enjoying it. Okay, mate. Cheers. Good luck. See you again soon. Um, okay, our next um, writer is uh, Zoe Siobhan Howard Lowe. Zoe, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so I'll start with one from I Have Grown Two Hearts. Night feeds. A cry splits open the night, tumbling orange slices, spilling dreams sideways. I stumble through the dark, trying to guess which room, playing whack-a-mole as you take turns being restless. And then my second one is, is from my very first book. Showering. This bottle. The one I find myself reaching for, the one you left behind, almost empty. The only thing you forgot in your hurry to leave. This is the bottle I reach for now. Hot water on skin and your bottle in my hand. The last liquid remains of you, your place in this house, this room. I rub the familiar scent into my skin, your scent. Lavender and tea tree, I rub. Lather, let your scent cling to me, feeling the sharp sting of the tea tree and the way the skin shivers at the coldness of the liquid, then wash it off. Wash you off. Let your scent run off my body and down into the drain. I am washing you away, the last of you, all except those last few traces of scent that linger intimately. And then I've got one to finish. How sweet the bells sound, now the nuns are dead, from the Jew of Malta by Christopher Marlowe. They found the last one, up in the bell tower, hung like the crucifix on a rosary, a candle snuffed at her feet, a bell rope tied round her neck. Her weight, pendulum-like, moving the bell clapper, metal grinding metal, resonating hum of notes dropping away, fragments like questions. She hung trying to chime the call for mass, the, for evening vespers, but the bells defied her, taking on voices, singing out, nursery rhymes, ditties, shanties, breakaway Broadway hits, no longer restrained in dogma. The bells all sound sweeter, now the last nun is dead. Thank you. Excellent, thank you for that, Zoe. Thank you very much. Okay, our next um, our next uh, writer reader is uh, David Bond. Welcome back, David. Hiya, thank you. <clears throat> I'm just going to do a, a quick story. So if it goes on too long, just stop me. But um, hopefully it's not too long. Um, so it's called The Talking Cat. Hello, Billy, said the cat nonchalantly. How do you know my name? Oh, I've been up and down these parts for years. I know everyone here. I've heard some of your school friends talking to each other. They should be nice to you. You realise that my friends will think I'm crazy if you find me talking to a cat. Yes, I understand that. 
I wouldn't talk to just anybody, but you seem like such a nice young chap. I apologise for any distress calls. Taken aback by the cat's rather formal manner, Billy was lost for words. Crumbs, I haven't even introduced myself. My name is John Mittens, or Mittens for short, and yes, I'm a talking cat. Billy looked around. Nobody was there to witness the spectacular scene unfolding, and that was that between the little boy and the talking cat. Gradually overcoming his fear, Billy began to talk to the cat every day as he walked home from school, striking up something of a friendship. One day, Billy stepped off the school bus a little later than usual as he remained talking with his friends. He began to argue and Billy fell back, head down and hands in his pockets. John Mitten sensed something was wrong. I'm just fed up with my friends at the moment. They're going too far. It'll be okay in the end. Hmm, mused John Mittens. Nothing much more was said between the two. They went their separate ways. A few minutes passed. Blood-soaked screams snaked their way through the streets. Those unfortunate to hear knew that death was the sound, a brutal, gruesome death. A wave of revulsion coursed through Billy. He knew immediately it was his friends that had been screaming, and now they screamed no more. He could smell the blood hanging thick in the air. The iron taste contorted his tongue, and he began to gag. John Mittens returned, slinking along with a self-satisfied smirk. Where did you go? Oh, I paid a little visit to your friends. They lacked respect. Please, God, no, don't tell me. Billy had a keen sense that a new trauma was unfolding before his eyes. He bullied you, did he not? You told me so yourself. That's what friends do. I'm afraid the deed is done. Billy fell to the floor. His cries of anguish were interrupted only by the piercing wail of police sirens. His world began to close in on him as the uh, police officers stepped forward. The sky was illuminated blue and the ground was drenched in red. When the police officers arrived, John Mittens was nowhere to be seen. And that was that between the little boy and the talking cat. And some years later, a conversation was had. Old Billy, now there's a name I haven't heard in a while. He's been inside for years, I'll never be allowed out. So how did he do it? Did he kill them? Of course he did. But to his dying breath, he'll maintain that it was a cat that did it, not him. A cat? Yes, old Billy says his name is John Mittens. Nobody believes him. And there's no sign of there ever being a cat with that name. By all accounts, it seems Billy, Billy created the cat in his own mind to distance himself from the actions he'd taken. So he'll never be released. He'll have to stop believing the lie he's created first. And that was that between the little boy and his imagination. And that's it. Thanks. Excellent stuff. Thanks, David. And, um, you know, good timekeeper as well, mate. Um, it's always nice to hear some prose and, um, and poetry always, of course, you poets. But, uh, yeah, Thank you. Ex excellent stuff. Thank you for that. Um, I've put the running order up um, for the first half. And just to reiterate, it's, it, it's, it's um, uh, Gordon's all learn next, then, then Ian... Um, O'Brien and Fakina, then Esther, Roy, Amanda, Andy, and Richard to round off the first half. And everybody else is on, including me, is on the second half, if that's okay. Um, I know John Campbell's come as well, just come, so John will put you on the second half, mate. It'd be, it'd be sort of towards the end. Um, should be finishing about quarter to ten, ten to ten. Um, okay, mate, cheers. Um, okay, lovely. Next up is. Gordon Zola. Welcome back, Gordon. Hello. Yeah, everyone there? Yeah. Okay. What's this about Melinda and Bill Gates, eh? Apparently, I heard that his micro went soft. I posted that on Facebook, but the fact checkers said it could be misleading. It's without foundation. Anyway, I've got two pieces tonight. Uh, the first is a little bit of prose. And it's called Kitchen Sink Drama. Last night, all hell burst out in the kitchen when the pot called the kettle black. The kettle boiled in anger. The fridge demanded that they cool it. And the tap spitting venom wouldn't let it sink until it had had its say. Roused from my sleep, I stormed into the kitchen. 
Come on, guys, what's up? I'm trying to get to sleep. They spat back, all resurrecting their righteousness. I took a deep breath, cleared my head and ambled over to the sink and turned the tap on, let the water flow. I said, my friend, you are my lifeblood. Smiling, I picked up the kettle and filled it from the tap. And you, my kettle, you buy all the water that comes from the tap. So I've got boiling water for you, my precious pot, to cook my food, kept fresh in the fridge, my faithful fridge. Can't you see? We need each other. We need to work together to survive. The only sound was a robin warming up for a dawn chorus. And then the pot called the kettle black. Okay, that's my. Okay, this, this second piece is, uh, well, it's over 20 years old, but I think it's probably more relevant now than when I wrote it. It's called The Name Game. Is life a battle? If you come from Hastings? If you come from Chorley? Is it a piece of cake? Do you have to be a tart to live in Baywell? If your name's sleep, you ever awake? Do you deserve applause if you come from Clapham? Do you never shower if you come from Bath? Any more than a house? If you come from Sandwich, if your name's Giggles, are you having a laugh? Do Smiths forge for a living, our meek, humble and giving, our dances having a ball? If your name's Foot, hmm, are you 12 inches tall? If you come from Avon, you're always calling. If you're an angel, you're always falling. Our rights ever wrong. And if your name's Sing, ah, do you know the song? If you come from Leeds, do you never follow? If your name's Joy, have you known no sorrow? If it's Cain, are you ever able? Or are we much more than a label? Do we have to keep playing the name game, repeating the same again and again? Living out life's dramas with all its panoramas, up and on and off the carousel of the salvage heaven from someone else's hell. Because when that last penny and breath are spent and it's time to make that final curtain call, what we called or where we come from will mean fuck all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks. Thanks for that, Gordon Zola. I reckon uh, the only thing that aged there was Avon Call, and I think the rest of it he did, it stood up, you know? <laughs> Again? I said the only thing I think that we, that sounded 20 years old was Avon Calling. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest, the rest stood up for, to the test of time. Thanks for that. Entertaining and, and, and observant as ever. Uh, I think that's the first time in the seven, six, seven years of, I've known you. I've never heard you read a prose piece out, so uh, yeah, nice one. Thanks for that. Um, okay, our next um, our next reader is um, oh yeah, this chap is uh, Ian uh, O'Brien. Ian actually runs a night in well on Zoom for the past year or so, but in Stockport, and I know that he's they're opening, he's starting live again at the Peter's Gate Tap. Cheers, right? Steve. Yeah, it's the uh, the Peter's Gate. Can you hear me okay, by the way? My yeah. microphone's been a bit, oh, great. Uh, the Peter's Gate tap, yeah, so it's the last Thursday of the month, so the next one's on Zoom. I'll send a link round, and then um, after that, yeah, it's the Peter's Gate for the for our new venue, so always welcoming, obviously, poetry, prose, all different kinds, you know. Excellent. Can get along. Great. Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've been along a few times to, on, on Zoom as well, and I'm, I'm going yeah. to go to Stockport and uh, 
be nice to actually see people in the flesh and have a bit. Yeah, of, great stuff. That way, yeah. So, um, well, yeah, excellent. Okay, Ian. Cheers, uh, Dave. On you go, mate. Nice one. Um, okay, this is a, a flash fiction piece called Mice. And it's about... Um, well, I won't, I won't talk, give it away, really. It should speak for itself. This is, this is called Mice. I didn't play myself in the reconstruction of when the police finally arrived. It was an actor walking the dog past the house. I didn't think he looked like me, but his hood, up, his hood was up anyway, so you couldn't really tell. Reporters still surface from time to time, ask how I feel about it now, if it haunts me still, if I'll move. Now that they've torn down the house and left a hole in the street like a missing tooth. I'm the one who didn't hear them. They don't remember my name, rarely print it. The neighbour. The one who didn't hear them when they were banging on the walls or tapping the pipes when he'd gone out. The one who didn't answer their midnight Morse code, their frightened fingers on the bricks. When they ask, I tell them what they want to hear. How, of course, I wish I was more curious. How I might have heard a noise once maybe twice, late at night, but didn't think anything of it. Mice, wind in the attic, a loose tile, that kind of thing. All that time, they ask. And I can see it in their eyes, hear it in their loaded voices, in the ever so slight curling of a top lip, a hidden, polite scorn. I can almost hear them reassure themselves on how they would have known what to do, would have sensed, would have raised the alarm in time, would have heard. All those years and you didn't hear a thing, not even when they broke the glass the time before, before the police were called for the last time. I don't tell them that I did hear once, maybe twice, maybe lots of times. Don't tell them how at night, when the wind is high and reaching through the branches, making the loose fence panel tap, tap against its post, when it is scaling the rooftops and lifting the loose tile like a cat flap, how I can still distinguish between the distant fox cries and the tinkling of cans loosed from bin bags, between the footsteps and the rain in the gutter, how I can still how, if I try especially hard, even on the wildest of nights, I can hear just about behind the headboard, beyond the bricks, their fingers leaving their prints. What's that, folks? I promise the rest of the coalition that's a bit more cheery than that, or it usually is. <laughs> well, I can't promise that, actually. It's a lie. It's not <laughs> just as gloomy as that, to be honest. But thanks. Cheers, folks. Thanks, Ian. Great stuff. Um, nice, uh, nice balance tonight with the prose and poetry. Um, okay, our next, um, our next, oh, our next uh, person to read is actually is, is, is a poet. So it's back to poetry um, with uh, Fakina, Fakina Maton. Oh, uh, thank you, Steve. The um, the big word at the moment is tea. So I brought three travel poems. <laughs> um, and they're from my uh, first collection, Another Life. Leaving Czechoslovakia in 1964, when we reached the border, you know, the small red Trabant, our cases were lighter. The pleated dresses, jeans we'd given to aunts and nieces, our footsteps behind us on the mountain, where we walked with her family up towards the border with Poland. Our plums, plimsolls wet, our hair length from drizzle, sweet and savory knatliki we'd eaten, songs we'd sung, drunk on vodka, already flown, small skittering birds. The yellow obdiska sign in Prague, diverting us into the paths of a funeral, black plumed horses. The border guards with their guns gather around us as we try again to open the boot, our stiff smiles telling us not 
to think of the airmail letters for America hidden under the back seat. And um, mishap. It was all voice activated and I didn't know whether to speak German straight away or wait till I got to Leipzig. I prepared a list of questions to ask J.S. Bach, smuggled in a cassette recorder with the fugue my late father had composed in his honor. A model of digits and dials and the adrenaline rush, I wasn't fast enough to decipher all those Roman numerals. So there I was in the fertile Nile Delta, queuing up to dance for Amenhotep III, doing that sideways walk with the hands, worried Anubis would scorn my heart, knowing that the time machine would be appropriated by Amenhotep for his tomb and the journey to the afterlife. So when I uh, moved to Manchester in the mid eighties, I joined uh, SPICE, special program of initiative, challenge and excitement. Did loads of exciting things. So this is a poem is actually dedicated to Dave Smith who used to run it from Grassington, June. We had been following the Roman road, Rita, who was almost 80, her bearded son clutching champagne, the pale daughter-in-law and me still gripping the metal frame. Our shadow floated ahead of us, scaring sheep and deer into running towards the orange early evening. The only sound creaking wicker and a hissing of gas. We ducked as we rushed over telephone lines, fences, treetops, the Land Rover still keeping up with the bottle of whiskey to placate the farmer on whose field we hoped to land. Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. That's very good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Wonderful stuff. Okay. Um, our next reader and performer, our next writer and performer, is uh, Esther Koch. Hiya. Um, I'm just going to read two, as of yet, um, untitled poems, very, very new. Um, the second one, well, I'll introduce the second one in a minute. Um, it was written for a purpose, um, but here's my first one. I have childbearing lips. My soft palate is a creche. My wonky incisors a safety gate to prevent reprobate prefront prefrontal whims from floundering out of my stalagmite mouth. They coil and crinkle at your feet like fortune telling fish. You whirl and in a tantrum abandon me and my words like worms curlicue. Tattoo the street in tiny sedillas. The cracks between the flags soften like French seas, but I hit the pavement hard. I am gayer. I make Olympian mistakes with my eloquence. Heavy is the head of a titanic gobshite. <laughs> so yeah, um, somebody give me a title for that one. Um, <laughs> this second one um, is um, a commissioned piece um, that I am going to um, submit in a few days time um, to a festival. Um, and it's based on one of, um, somebody's some important person's um decision on what the 30 human rights are basic human rights um you'd think i'd know that with half a politics degree but i don't um and the one that this is loosely based on is uh the basic human right to public assembly um so it goes like this 
Displaced valley lilies sprout from the base scum of bollards. City sprites, expert campanologists that play to gravel colonies, bolt hole below their hung dead bells. They glow in the guttering light of arson and in the foreground, faces beneath balaclavas turn to smoke. A sabbat cat takes a toke on noxious air and Cossack dances into the chaos. His matted black nuka alive with fleas. The moon is leaking watery light like a fungal bed sore. She's proud of the industriousness of her children. And Baroness Sun, perimenopausal backbench bitch, waits eagerly to be called up by the speaker, planet Earth, to bring a cessation to the night has always belonged to the left. She knows that in four billion years, a bird song, we're all fucked anyway. The days are so hard for common people, caught in misguided propane trade winds from Minnesota, Hong Kong, and 1981, igniting them with their burning stomachs, pit stops in the witching hour for Savaloy refuels, pub handouts of Gary Lineker's fare, end terrace stamp and go, counterfeit pound notes flapping in the simmering pitch, salted to bait the rich into tar bogs like the relics they are. Their keening frightens the avarice out of nearby Ginnell children. Thank you. Great stuff, great stuff, Esther, brilliant. Um, what I like as well is I think the last couple of times you've come here and read some works in progress and I really like the idea of people doing that because you can actually got the chance to hear how it sounds out loud to other people and of course the second piece was, you know, highly accomplished. Uh, thank you, fantastic. Um, Lovely, we're doing okay for time. Well done, everybody. Um, I just need to get the the the, the running order. Oh, lovely! Yeah, our next the next person. Uh, welcome back to uh, South Ford, South Fordian, uh, Roy Page. Welcome back, Roy. Good to see you. Hi guys, nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Um, I've got two poems tonight. One of them, that the first one, I usually leave till Halloween. But I thought to myself, why should I? Because sometimes you miss it. It's gone. You know, it's here and it's gone. So I thought I'd give it to you tonight anyway. And um, you should get it because it's, it's about Hollywood anyway. And this is called Hollywood Monsters of Old. Growing up in the 60s, there were only four monsters on TV. Dracula, the Wolfman and Frankenstein and the curse of the ancient mummy. Every weekend we would all settle down in front of our black and white set and watch these monsters roaming round, killing villagers and biting necks. Frankenstein the monster, created from the dead, played by Boris Karloff with bolts through his neck, brought to life in a lightning storm when held up to the sky as Igor and the Baron shout, It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Then Dracula, the Prince of Darkness. Bella Lugosi plays the part. But he looks like that Ray Reardon who used to play Pot Black. He would use, he would, he would choose his female victims with heaving bosoms and creamy white thighs. Then he'd sink his teeth into their necks, saying, look into my eyes. Then there was the Wolfman. Lon Chaney Jr. played the part. And the only way to kill him was a silver bullet through his heart. But they always tried to get him when the moon was full and bright and he'd tear them all to shreds in the middle of the night. So the moral of this story, it will take your to, you to your doom. Never chase a wolf, wolf man by the light of the moon. And then at last there was the mummy. 2000 years ago he died returning to the present to find his long lost bride. Karloff played the part again, 
moaning and dragging a leg with 2,000 year old bandages wrapped around his head. These are the monsters I remember most made in black and white. No special effects or CGI, no technical or insight. You can keep your hammer horrors Friday the 13th or Halloween. These are the films I remember on that little black and white screen. Okay, cheers. Just a, uh, a little short one to finish, shortish. And it's called I'm Sorry. How many times do we say I'm sorry? In how many different ways? And do we really mean it when we apologize? I'm sorry I'm late. I'm sorry I can't wait. I'm sorry for your loss. You don't always mean what you say. In fact, sometimes you couldn't give a toss. I don't. I'm, I'm sorry to hear. I'm sorry, my dear. I don't love you anymore. I'm sorry it had to end like this. I'm sorry, but yes, I'm sure. Sorry seemed to be the hardest word when sung by Elton John. But he wasn't very sorry when it got to number one. I'm sorry for some things I did and some things I didn't do. I'm sorry for the homeless. It could be me or you. I'm sorry for the victims of those far off bloody wars. I'm sorry, but I don't have change to donate to your cause. I'm sorry I started smoking. I'm sorry I can't stop. I'm sorry I can't remember. I'm sorry I forgot. I'm sorry about this poem. It's just a sorry waste of time. I'm sorry to say I can't, cannot think of another sorry line. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, great ending. Bittersweet, that Roy. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Well done. Okay, next up is um, the three of us responsible for uh, Speakeasy, and the next two people are two thirds of that. Um, and next up is Amanda Steele. Okay, this first one's a piece of flash fiction. Uh, it's called Noises in the Elevator. I stepped into the elevator and pressed 12, then watched the doors close. There was a slight movement, then the voice spoke. You're going to die. I looked around, expecting to see something that confirmed it was a joke. That's not funny, I said, seeing nothing out of place. Floor 10. Floor 9. Floor 8, the voice said, and I thought I could hear distant screams. What? The elevator was going down instead of up. I pressed 12 again and again, but nothing changed. Remember when you were 12? The absent person spoke again. No, I shook my head, but I couldn't block out the memories of that night on my 12th birthday. Me pushing my sister as she leaned over the well while making a wish. It's not like I meant for her to fall in. I just didn't know my own strength. Then there was nothing I could do. I went home and the longer I went without confessing as the police were called and the search went on, the more I knew I could never say anything. The voice shocked me out of my unwanted memories. Floor three, floor two. The screams were louder now, like people being tortured. <coughs> like people being tortured. I'd never heard so much pain and despair. I reached the basement level and the doors opened. There stood my sister at the age she was when I killed her, dripping in blood and holding an axe. Hi, sis, she croaked. We're going to have so much fun down here. <laughs> and the next one's from my um, spoof clickbait collection that I'm putting together. It's called 10 Signs That He or She Is Not The One. They repeatedly call you by the wrong name and their eyes glaze over as if trying to recall a far off memory when you ask them to use your real name. They take you shopping as a special treat, but accidentally forget about you while you're in the toilet and drive off, feigning ignorance when you're called to ask where they are. They rearrange the letter magnets on the fridge to spell out go away or piss off. You find them with your brother or sister in a compromising position and they say they thought it was you, even though you look nothing alike. They take out their phone during sex and sign up to a dating site. 
They eat your food and tell you you didn't need it anyway because you've put on a few pounds. They invite you out for dinner, then introduce you to their other boyfriend or girlfriend. You walk in on the end of a phone conversation and hear them say, that's where I buried the body. None of their exes can be traced and they're vague on the details, saying something along the lines of, they moved away and don't use social media. When you're in public together, they say things like, I hope you last longer than the last one. And that's me done. <laughs> nice one, Amanda. Thank you for that. A couple of pieces of flash. Well done. Okay, our next reader is Andy M. Hi, guys. All right. Okay, at least I had warning now, so... <laughs> okay, right. Um, I've got an announcement to do as well, but I'll, do, I'll get the poems done first tonight. Both of these tonight are from the book I'm working on at the moment, which is a series of letters between a couple. So... The first one is called Hiding in the Black Halls in Farnworth. That is a pub in Farnworth. Do you remember the fact we were still really strange strangers, Sarah? Not even a couple when you came to meet me in Farnworth that lunchtime just after I returned to work. And we ended up sneaking out of the Black Halls and my boss walked in over an hour late into my lunch. Do you remember telling me in that stark knuckle-stained light under my breath when she walked into the side door and you saw me go white-faced? Why didn't you tell her the truth that we've simply lost track of time rather than rush out of the other exit? <laughs> you must be joking. My voice crackled under my breath like a dodger on a ghost train track, rubbing my nerves into bite-sized chunks, soothed by the way you followed me into the consuming mist without batting an eyelid. I pitch you, even now, running through the rain, to where we were parked, your hat sank over your nose and carrying your shoes after they turned into cups of water and stood there laughing when we both got back to our cars. You couldn't have planned it. I remember you saying, who would have thought she'd turn up when we were there, laughing to yourself, your laughter catching in rain in emotion. Leave me unaware even then how much impact you were about to leave on my life. Okay, right, quick announcement on the, before I go any further, a couple of you know as well, Ant Smith, that is a regular here. He's involved in doing some sort of charity fair fate over at Alexander Park on the 23rd of May. And they're going to have stuff like healers, coaches, yoga teachers, meditation practice, but there is going to be a poetry open mic tent there now, I believe it's running from 12 to 2. I'm going to put Ant's email address on, on the, in the chat column later. If you want to get a chance to perform, it's in person. It's not on Zoom. So drop him an email, OK? I don't know much more myself on it. So when you drop him an email, he'll tell you. OK, my other poem. This one's a new one, actually. And this is Rainstorms on Tantal Hill, which is a beautiful hill if you've ever been up there. Listening to the rain at home. Do you remember that time, Sarah, when we went walking over Tandle Hill and the heavens suddenly exploded, soaking everything at the summit and leaving us with nowhere to hide before we got to the pub at the other side of the hill? Do you remember the landlord saying we looked like drowned rats before passing us some towels, almost like they were expecting it? And then there was an old man by the door looking at Storm like he was purchasing regret, ripped from another time. He wanted me to go and check he was okay, and in hindsight I should have gone over. But my mind was elsewhere, far away from the worry in your eyes, and centred around more inward, worrying about ourselves, not over people's demons tangled in a self-portrait. How two storylines came together for just a few moments into the same plot before pulling itself apart like we did later. Unable to face your past as you walked into the shadows, leaving me perched in regret, rattling my heart to a stand still. That's me done, guys. Have a great night tonight. Keep it up. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for that. Um, okay, we've got a couple of more people to, 
to read. Are you getting some echo on that? No. Okay. You've got a couple yeah, of echo on Steve, yeah. An echo, yeah. Okay. I've got a couple more people to read. Um before I know you said before lunch, before the break. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're doing well for time, guys, if we can keep keep it up. Um our next uh, reader is um from Nottingham, I believe. Is that right? You're from Nottingham, Richard? No. How many Richards are there? Richard is, 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 is you, mate. There's a rich, but you're rich. It's me. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Withensea, near Hull. Near Hull, okay, mate. Okay. Yep. Yeah, well, and I, I'm, I got the invite by Andy and Amanda, and Amanda found out that I have fairy tales and unicorn poems, so I'm doing one of those for Amanda. <clears throat> um, and it's called How the Unicorn could return. The unicorn, its name was Leonard, lay mortally ill, bleeding from terrible wounds inflicted on him by mankind with its pollution, glass and plastic lying waste in its secret inland lake where he came to relax and to swim. As he was about to expire, he heard sounds and noise of salvation as Melinda the fairy, who had been a, a witch, came by. She's in 14 of my poems, just to let you know. She made magic spells and called all the forces of good to her. She called on the earth, the wind, fire and water, all the elements. She called, called on the spirits of all that mankind had killed. The dodo, the Tasmanian tiger, the great orc and more. So many responded, their spirits so strong that a real magic was worked. This call to the depths of primeval mysticism. And as a result, a phoenix was reborn and drew near. It saw Leonard lying near death and flew over, reacting to his pain and tears, mystical with healing powers, flowed freely that day. Leonard was revived and survived mankind's mess. Melinda worked her magic and all unicorns became invisible. And never again was a unicorn seen by mankind. <laughs> That's why they are thought to be mystical or rare. But if we ever learn to clean up our act to us, they will return. Uh, so... <laughs> That's, I have a five-part unicorn saga. I don't think you can put up with all of it. Um, I've, uh, so that was for you, Amanda. Okay. <laughs> um, and I've got a new book out. I can't add, join in the chat because I'm on this portal thing that doesn't let me. This is Awakening on Stairwell Books. You can just Google it if, you, if you're interested. Um, and this is my look. Had my hip replaced, was in pain afterwards for a while. Looked after in hospital, brought home by ambulance. Helped inside my home. My wife nursed me brilliantly, missed having a bath, but after washing well for a while, had a glorious hot shower. Power shower. Felt great, got some pain in my joints, used heat pads, deep heat spray. My eczema returned. Annoying, but I have emollient creams. Had extra showers and soothed the itching, all under control. If uncomfortable, more showers snuggled down in my bed, thick duvets, warm, can rest and recover. Lucky me, pain gone, recovered well. But what if I was homeless? What if I was not lucky? Can you imagine the misery, pain and depression of being ill, needing help? and lying out vulnerable to attack while the Christmas shoppers go by. How in the name of humanity can we allow this suffering on our wealthy streets? And a suffering that is growing is not being addressed and not reduced. How? Um, and then just a very short one, if I have time for a very short one. Short one, mate. Great. Yep. Um, it's because of the Halloween one that was, was it Roy that did a Halloween one? I just thought, oh, I'll do this little one. Because uh, you don't do them, you just do them madly for two weeks, don't you? And this is called Bloody Halloween. The house is dark and empty, boarded up and lonely. No one goes in, no one will. They dare not. Yet only five years ago, Susan lived there with her cat 
the sweetest pure white fur baby eyes blue as the deepest sea the most beautiful beauteous sapphire on halloween they'd stayed up till midnight on the stroke of the clock the cat jumped up and screamed fur stood on end eyes turned blood red leapt from her lap to susan's throat claws went in deep blood flowed susan died her cat licked her blood and went to sleep. It was months before they found her. The cat was fat by then, and no one will go in that house. So, three, three very different ones, I think. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. And well read as well. And good luck. Good luck with the. Um, good luck with the, with the book. Okay. Cheers. Thank and, you. Okay. Awakening. Yeah. Right, what, what? What's the name of the press again? It's Awakening, uh, yeah. and it's published by Rose Drew, who you may know, uh, Stairwell Books at York, and it's okay. on Amazon things. And if, if you join me on Facebook, you can. I've got them here to sign, so I can send them. You know, I can sell them from here. But um, if you, if you join me on Facebook, you're more than welcome to do that, or else buy it from Rose Rose Drew. In which case, in these times, sadly, it's not signed because I haven't been able to bomb over to York, you know, to sign a load of books. But uh, thank you very much. Stairwell Books, York. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Richard. Good luck. Good luck with that, mate. Okay, I'll um I'll finish the first half off. I'll put the second half uh, running order up uh, during the interval. So uh, this probably I'll be about I'll be about three minutes, three, two or three minutes. So and then we can have a break for all till nine. Okay. So this first poem is it's a little couple of poems. The first one is sort of I suppose it was inspired by the sort of Boris Johnson getting his flat decorated fiasco here. Yeah? Um, Slash broad maybe, um, okay. Um, it's called it's called um, corporate social responsibility. Volunteers wearing pinstripe suits and bowler hats, carrying paint pots, dust sheets, brushes and rollers, turn up unexpected on my doorsteps. I invite them in, make cups of tea, chat about their week in the city how the interest rate is too low, get tips on investing my stash while an eclipse peels off without the aid of a steamer, making scrapers redundant. Bailiff lids, I like primrose, sage, cornflower, ox for magnolia. I hope next week if they come back, they'll bring an office bureau I'll eat my tea off, an executive chair to swivel on, Till I make myself sick. I'll dig out the family portrait, hang it on freshly painted walls, bootlace tight dad and beehive mum, either side of their only child. Now a 60 year old orphan, maybe I'll be adopted onto a scheme by a company who invests in me, commute to wharf side mirrored building, make cups of tea, send faxes. Rush to the mailroom for last post. Eat sandwiches from greaseproof paper. Say good night to the cleaner. Be the last to leave. Our second poem is a short poem called Choices. And I've been sort of trying to get a poem down. And I was watching the snooker finals the other night, and it sort of helped me. And I suppose it's about like when you try your first pair of jeans on and then you try 300 pairs on and then you decide to go back to the first one. It's a bit like that. I was thinking of something like that. And, and what, I, what the snooker pundit on TV said was, it sort of got me going with it really. It's called Choices. Snooker pundits on TV say you see the best shot to play right away. Yet you weigh up options. Safety first. Cannon off the yellow. Long pot corner pocket, stun the white to bought, screw it, hide behind the black, chalk the tip of your cue, go for the one all along was best, rack up a maximum break. Afterwards in the press room, sipping lager on prescription, you think of riding pillion on her motorbike over peaks, both of you in your teens, 
the lies greener than blue. Okay, thank you. Um, great stuff. So, so it's uh, almost quarter two. So um, we'll see you at uh, see you at nine o'clock. Okay, thanks for the first half. Brilliant. Well read. So, Roy, you gave me the idea to do a Halloween poem. I thought, yes, that's right. I've got a few, but they they just stay there till around Halloween. And if you haven't got too many gigs, then you don't do them, do you? Yeah. Oh, that's what I was thinking, because I was having a little flick through myself, thinking what to read tonight. And I thought, I kind of enjoy doing that one. You know, it's a little bit of an old yeah. memory kind of thing. And, uh, and yeah, sometimes you if you don't do anything near Halloween, you miss out and it's next year again. Yeah, you know? yeah. Same, um, with a lot, same with a lot of stuff like holidays and, you know. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, I've got, a, I've got a New Year permanent and there's no gigs around New Year, is there, you know? No, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. And when Amanda said, oh, do a unicorn one. Yeah. I tried to time three, then I just thought three three unicorn ones is overwhelming. It will just get boring. People will turn off. So I thought, let's do something else, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I selected the other one from the book, but I thought I need a short one. And then when you did that, I thought, oh, and in fact, I wrote that in lockdown. So I've never performed it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, because Halloween didn't happen last year, did it really? You know? No, not really. Um, no. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I thought oh, I'll get that out because you, you never know whether it, something works until you read it, do you? And I could see from faces that people quite liked it. So uh, that's, that's right, all yeah. right. Then. Yeah, can't beat, a, can't beat a little bit of blood and guts, can you? You know, a little bit yeah. of imagination. Well, I, I, having listened to Amanda's, I knew it wasn't yeah. too gory. That's, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. I just like something. Yes, but uh, yes. 
because I, she talked about flash fiction. I wasn't entirely sure what it was, so I Googled it. <laughs> oh, you have to tell me then. <laughs> oh, it's all about this gore and blood and guts and stuff, you know. Is it? They call it, they call it flash fiction, apparently. I, I didn't know that. But uh, there you go. Andy laughing at that. <laughs> I thought it was funny when he turned the mic off on you and when you were talking about, um, uh, you know, um, muting. Yes. Um, I thought that was quite fun. <laughs> a typical Andy we, incompetence. Yeah, we, could see his, we, we could see his face a lot of it. It was fun looking at people because they were all laughing, you know. They all got it. <laughs> typical me, mate, is all I'm going to say. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, there you go. I'll fill up. Oh, I think this is the first time I've been at this one. I'm, I am getting to be on so many. It's getting me completely confused, you know. I think, oh, this is where I, you know, I, I do, I, I arrive sometimes. So I think, oh, I know everyone here, you know. Um, but I get all these emails and just accept madly, you know. I think Andy must have invited me here, didn't you? I always invite people as people I shouldn't know. <laughs> he's yeah, he's well, I'm, like I'm, us in down south. Roy's in the pub. Roy, well done, Ben, on Poets Rule the Word tomorrow as well. I did decide that three unicorn poems was too much. You can have one a week, <laughs> one a month. It'll take us five months to get through the tale. You can never but, the unicorns. Amanda believes unicorns are all the world. <laughs> yes, but um, the the Melinda the witch um, has her own poem, and then she comes into many others. So she's in, and I've got various series, and she comes in as the rescuing angel. You see, she was a very bad, wicked witch, and she takes on goodness, and that turns her into a fairy, which she's most reluctant to be. But now she's got to do good for the rest of her life. Um, <laughs> very, very blight and esque, which is probably not a fashionable thing to be, but I suppose I am, yes. Does flash fiction need to have a horror theme then? It's not just about a short piece of fiction. Uh, uh, does it is Amanda? Oh, it does, it, does it is Amanda? Oh no, no. Oh, why, John? No, no. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was more about a just a, a small piece of fiction. A small piece of fiction, basically. Yeah. He was a bit trouble. Yeah. When I've got Amanda here, go on. You, you know more about flash yeah. fiction than I do. Tell John. So is it not all gory? Is it not all gory then? <laughs> not so, I believe. So Richard, you're from Hull. Are you are you are you near Hull? Did you say I'm, I'm from Withensea? Well, we've retired to the coast to Withensea, which is a tiny little Victorian yeah. town. Um right. about an hour from Hull. It just drives straight to the coast and you get to Withensea. Oh. Um but I lived 40 years in Leeds, and before okay. that, I grew up in Harrogate, which is why I speak like this, because this is how they speak. In... <laughs> well, actually, if I put my Harrogate yeah. voice on, how I speak normally is what Leeds did to me. So this is sort of Leeds and Harrogate. And so I've lived in three of the, three yeah. of the parts of Yorkshire. I've never lived anywhere else, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, just love with them. It's like, it's like living in the 50s. Is it? No, I haven't, I haven't got the railway se uh, station that that was taken away in the sixties by Beeching. So we now, you know, it's very um, community orientated and it's very slow paced. You know, yeah. we don't have any chain stores. We have a small, 
we have a small Tesco and a small pound stretch and a small Aldi, um, which is more than enough for us. Um, We have a post office, so that's good. Um, But uh, yes, I I like living here. Um, Some changes, Hull's Hull's seen some changes over the last few years, hasn't it? Yes, well, I, when I when we were chatting before, I think I mentioned um, Petula Clark, and I'm a life lifelong fan. And I came to Hull in about 1980 to see her in concert, and it was a dump. God, it was yeah. smelly and awful. And so when we decided to move to Withensea, I said to my wife, "If you're going shopping in Hull, you're going by yourself. I'm not going in there." And of course, it's magnificent. It's the most lovely yeah. place. And I spend five nights a week there performing normally. Yeah. And it's just got a fantastic scene in the culture, but the museums, the docks have all been sort of gutted and, and yeah, modernized. And there's, yeah. there's so many museums in the, I've never known a place like it and they're all free. Yeah. And the art gallery is amazing. And it, it, I, just, I love it more than any other city <laughs> I've ever lived in, you know. That's, so, what city, um, that's what the city of culture does for you. Oh, no, it was long before the City of Culture. <laughs> City of yeah, Culture didn't do much. All it did was import in. Um, lot, I mean, they, they had these this couple doing a symphony on, on the Humber Bridge, and they were Norwegian. I thought, what's that got to do with all? And, um, Painted you know, everybody you had, blue. They had all sorts of people like Maureen Lippmann come back to read to us, which never comes near the place normally, um, yeah. and that sort of thing. So there was a lot of culture and events going on before, and since, um, I mean, they spent millions putting down brand new paving stones, which didn't need replacing. And now they've just taken some up and replaced them with tarmac. So yeah. it's, you know, it's just ridiculous. A um, lot of lot of good stuff, but some it was very high high for looting and imported in. But there was a fantastic scene in all the pubs and clubs around Hull before City of Culture, during City of Culture, and since, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was used, uh, and and this caused, um, somebody, I got a phone call, and they said, would you do a video as um, a poet on our um, City of Culture site? I said, well, I'm not going to say no, am I? You know, so I said, yes, that, that sounds lovely, how, how nice. And they had, it's called Meet the Artist, it's still on. And you can see a ballerina and a sculptor and a tap dancer or whatever, you know. And I thought they were going, genuinely thought that there were going to be lots of poets. And no, there was just me. And of course, I'm not from Hull. I'm from Harrogate and Leeds and live in Withensea. So I was the, the poet on this bloody website. And have I had some grief from Hull poets about that? But never mind. Can't do much about it. It never occurred to me. I just thought that they'd be finding 10 of us and we'd all have a video, you know. Mm. But... They sent talent scouts out and they'd like me. So what can I do? If somebody says, are you going to do a video for a website? You normally say yes, don't you? You don't say, oh, no, let me have somebody else do it. Never occurred to me. But there you go. Ho hum. (laughs) Such is life. Yeah. But yes. And I largely blather on about my grandkids and things like that on the video. Um, And I found out I used the word amazing. You must have, you know, you get interviewed. <laughs> and when you watch it back, you say, Did I, do I use the word amazing every other sentence? And um, yes, I do, apparently. I try not to now. <laughs> Ooh. I was thinking of blue people as well. I saw those pictures a few years ago in, the, in Hull. I forget the name of the artist, Roy, but that was... Um... Yeah, that was an amazing piece of work, really. It's it another another one done in um, Newcastle as well, I think. Really? Yeah, we, we've had some. Um, we had a fantastic statue before lockdown of um, uh, this fantastic statue made out entirely out of knives seized after uh, Sorry, knife yes. crime. And it was this spectacular angel, and she was wonderful. And they, they've done so many light displays and things like that. They're, they're, we, we've got a Banksy, you know, which a friend of mine actually uh, 
saved because it got vandalized, you know, and he went and um, cleaned it that day. So the paint was still sort of wet. Um, and uh, that knife, they, the knife one went, went around the country, didn't it? Took it, it did. Yeah. yeah, it went um, the country, yeah. I, saw it I, I saw it both in daytime and nighttime because appearing, I appear at a little, um, it's sort of like a, oh, a cocktail yeah. bar. That's what they call it. Um, and in fact, that's coming back on. I've been invited back and I'm thinking, do I want to go into a cocktail bar? Because <laughs> it's a bit iffy now, isn't it? But to, we're going to have to take small steps and make sure it's safe. But then I went to see it illuminated. It was fantastic at night with lights on it. It was just amazing. And a, a mate of mine at Leeds does a lot of work with knife crime. And he drags me over there to work with him, a guy called Phil Pierce. Um, and he's amazing. He, he he also works at a drug rehab place, and um, having heard and learnt so much from him about it, it was just staggering to see and to think these weren't just knives. These were knives that had been seized and had yeah. probably been used. You know, so uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that was, it was. In fact, at night with the light on it, it was just staggering with all this sparkling coming off it. Yes. But, you know, they, they, they have brilliant exhibitions at, um, there, there was a Hockney exhibition at the uh, uh, Ferrens Art Gallery. You know, I don't think I'd ever get to see Hockney in the, in the flesh, really, you know, if it wasn't for that. And it's free. In fact, a friend of mine who was as tight as a duck's backside uh, came to visit and we took them into Hull. And I just walked towards the Ferrens Gallery and he's pulling back and I'm saying, what's up with this? Well, how much is this going to cost me? I said, no, no, it's free. <laughs> don't, know where, don't, don't know what it costs when, where you come from, but um, in Hull, you just walk into these magnificent places and nobody charges you. It's just stonking. Great. Mm. Great. All right, folks. Um, okay, lovely. So it's nine o'clock and we'll get... Um, We'll get cracking with the second half of um, what's turning out to be a great night again. Um, the, uh, the first person to kick us off, uh, to kick, oh sorry, the, the, the person to kick us off for the second half. And it's a big welcome back to Rich Davenport. Welcome back, Rich. Hello. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start with the smattering of gibberish um, <laughs> from my book, uh, which is Gormless, appropriately titled. Um, and uh, the, the, I've got a couple from this, and then I've got some flash fiction, which I've not tried before. So uh, um, I'll uh, run these two by you. This first one is... Um, uh, there we go. This um, involves stealing somebody's dentures uh, so I'll approximate the gift of dentures like this. I'll, this is called Fudge Rumpus. I sleepwalked in a sweet shop and caused a fudge rumpus. Stole the dentures of the shop assistant. Then three toffee apples whispered, come here and scrumples. The voices were very insistent. As the shopkeeper's Ninja skills flowed me. I cried out, You're now but a toothless fud pimp. Me thrust the gobstopper. I'll not tell you where. Let's just say I still walk with a limp. Um, thank you. <laughs> this next one. Is, thank you. Uh, this is called uh, Thrice Around the Custard Bush. <laughs> Thrice Around the Custard Bush to twang the parson's breeches. Grip the gusset, then run off to see how far it reaches. For he is rife with hemorrhoids. We'll draw them out with leeches. Apply them, apply them firmly, do not stop, no matter how he screeches. <laughs> Thrice around the custard bush to seek a maiden's favour. Quick, warn her of this treachery while there is time to savour. This rascal is not worthy of a maid so fair and curvy. The talk around the privy says is wrought with clap and scurvy. Thrice around the custard bush, I danced with clogs on fire. At last, I did not notice that the sparks flew ever higher, and now I sit in prison with my breeches burned to cinder, for I did cool my blistered cheeks against the convent window. Thank you. Uh, and then this is um, kind of a crime thing. Uh, have I closed it? Oh, that would be clever. 
I'll be right with you. I'm just opening my file. Uh, terribly sorry. This one is called The Worst Advice I Ever Received. It's a very quick flash fix. I think I'm in almost the right folder. So this is what's known as a technical gremlin. Uh, there we go. I did have it open. I appear to have closed it. I'll be right with you. Here we go. The worst, right. the worst advice I ever received. Do you know what was, hands down, the worst advice I ever received? Go on. It was dance like nobody's watching. But they were watching. All of them. Their soulless, sneering eyes, mocking my every step. That is why I had to gouge them out with a dessert spoon. That is why I was forced to silence them. All of them. And is that all you have to say in your defense, Sister Margaret? It is, Your Honor. Sounds legit to me. I once strangled a guy for laughing at my break dancing. So I feel your pain, sister. You're free to go. Gouge your pair for me, sweetheart. Moments later, Sister Margaret was striding bold and determined into the biting Chicago morning air. Deep in the pocket of her habit, her thumb caressed her gouging spoon. A wicked grin swept slowly across her face. Maybe this time I'll try a polka, she cackled. I think that's quite a good for me, thank you. That's great, that. Great stuff, Rich. I think I had to mute it because I was just laughing all the way through. I would have been laughing over everything. Um, and also, I've got a cat. I've never had a cat before. And it's driving me crazy. I've not got a cat flap and it keeps me having to get out. So if you see me getting up and not being moved, I know when Moy was reading before, I had to get up and, and let it out and then let it back in and then let it back out. So, yeah. Thanks for that, Rich. Fantastic way to start us off. Um, our next reader, writer, is Martin Elder. Hi, everybody hear me? Yep, excellent. excellent. Right. Okay, a couple of poems. Uh, this one is, first one is called On Day Release, and it's <clears throat> not surprisingly about uh, the pandemic and coming out of it. She walks at first quite nervous with shaky considered steps, gingerly touching the pavement as if she expects it to move, to withdraw from under her, to suck her up back into the dark chasm she's left. Instead, she finds the pavement solid, unyielding, unforgiving. She seems to grow as she lifts her frame upright, her head rises to the sun. The big open sky is almost too much as she reaches the park and the grass the grass that she has missed so much. She stops, closes her eyes. She wants to scream, to yell at the top of her voice. I'm here right now. She feels the smiling elastic sun and the creaking cogs of her body stretch as her bones and muscles engage. She takes off her shoes and socks, then her jacket, her t-shirt, her jeans. For a moment, she stops, opens her eyes, looks around, nobody. She slips off her bra and pants. She doesn't want to stop. She wants to peel off her skin layer by layer, her muscle and vein. She wants to pull and tug to rip and tear. But instead, she walks slowly at first and then quicker, beginning to jog. She picks up the pace, quicker still, feeling the grass lush under her feet, brushing past bushes and trees, breaking into a full run, feeling the breeze hitting her goosebump flesh. The excitement, the adrenaline courses right through her on and on until besieged by heavy beating breathing chest she stops and sits among the startled charming birds and wants to sleep to find all the rest she has missed over the previous 12 prison crazy months she sighs as her breathing is back to before and she picks herself up from the curled up ball nest where she had laid feeling the breath of the daydream stream across her face through her open window, oblivious to the sights, the cars, the traffic, the preordained coughed up cover of screams and smells. The bubble bursts and suddenly the clamoring world hits her full on. 
she lifts her eyes wide open, the dream remains a dream, yet majestic and real, as real as the dew on her clothes and the mud on her feet. Thank you, first one. Okay, uh, this next one is called uh, An Island of Silence, slightly shorter. I feel nothing except the noise in my head, the unspoken questions, the soundbite words, but this is my day, much like yesterday and the day before as I walk through the streets, the park meeting uneasy smiles and hellos, some blank looks as if the world has been switched off and back out on the street where a woman padded out with too many coats is shouting, swearing, cursing the world, wanting to blame someone, everyone, just anything for this plague running through her head, 19 to the dozen, the fight for body, mind and soul, a world on mute, deaf, dumb and blind to itself, gagged and forlorn. I want to say, I agree. I want to join her, but instead I walk on being my own island, lost to the world and the world lost to me, never considering what it may be like to be thrust back in. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Good to see you again. Great stuff. Thanks a lot. Our next writer reader is Lisa O'Hare. Welcome back, Lisa. Thank you. Um, I've got two. I've got um, a book of all my lockdown poems coming out, so I'll put that in the link afterwards. This is two, two from that. This is called Phone Atonement. I turn on my phone and I start to zone out, meaning to connect, but I'm starting to feel more alone as I scroll through content with no control. There's no content in my heart or my soul. As I swipe to, through today's hype, today's great side swipes and tripe, my head feels numb from others' insights, from humdrum to bot screaming scum. Pain throbs at my head as I scroll through yet another never ending thread. I need to take stock. How on earth did I get here? About to press block on Billy Piper's ex. It comes as a shock, you should care what he thinks, but we do. And it's not because we want to. It's not because we want to. But I need to press block on those who shock and mock and to shake this feeling so hollow, I need to press unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. Opinions have become so absolute, there's no way back to nuance or making a mute point in this app of increasingly ill repute where people are free to le left free to persecute I remember I can press mute 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 and if I really don't like someone's tone I consider putting down the phone put down the phone and go outside and atone for my time behind the screen get out and speak to someone real and instantly realize how much better that makes me feel that's my first one um, and the second one is called The Death of Decency. I'm going to take my glasses off to read this one because I was struggling with the last one. Um, decency dressed smartly that day as they always did. Although their invitations were drying up, decency now accused of being a mere signal of virtue, now apparently a bad thing. Decency deceased, they said, by gaslight. Empathy extinguished, sympathy slayed, disdain now reigned. Undaunted by humanity, indecency was unrepentant, removed from remorse, goodwill, now a ghost. But charity inherited decency's clothes, so charity challenged those troubled by truth, ignored the insults and honoured honesty, demanded dignity, charity lovingly dedicated to the restoration of respectability. Charity weaved decency into all it did. Let others try it on for size, remembering how it feels to feel good. To help others feel good just felt good. A basic part of society's fabric, never out of fashion or packed away, a mere statement or signal, a virtue worn with pride. Pride that they don't let others fall. Decency is in the details. The devil is in the drivel. Deluded drivel, distorting drivel, deceiving, dodging drivel. Decency keeps its own frequency, reflects back drivel's deficiencies, holding its own. Decency never rests. 
decency never dies. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa, and congrats on the on the on the pub publication of your lockdown poems. Um, yeah, um, if you want to put the link on there, for, as you said, put a link on the chat for people. Uh, what's it called? It's called Lockdown Life: A Roller Coaster of Emotions. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, our next reader is um, it's another poet. It's uh, Susan Darlington, welcome back Susan, good to, good to see you. Thank you, it's good to be here again. Uh, I've got three short poems for you tonight. Uh, the first one is called The Unkindness. I was 12 when mother called me in from the woods, sat me on a kitchen chair and brushed my hair into braids. She told me I was now of age to stop childish games. It was time I learned the unkindness of womanhood. Silenced, she cut off my plaits, wound them around her head and affixed them with pins that made her scalp bleed. She kicked off the red stilettos in which I'd play-acted seduction and ran into the darkening thicket without a backwards glance. While my brothers fought over a plastic rifle in the yard and father slouched on the couch, one hand on the fly of his jeans. Thank you. Uh, we seem to have had a few pre-Halloween poems tonight, so I thought I would continue in that tradition. Uh, and this is a piece that I had published in the uh, Hedgehog's Press anthology of um, spooky tales last year. It's called The Last in a Long Line. On the last in a long line of ghosts, of women whose bloom grew diseased under the heat of the glass house who lost their minds and scuttled barefoot over forks after being told that no meant yes all their lives, whose blood ran down their legs and was washed from view down drains after a crochet hook and two hot baths. And the last in a long line of ghosts who fought to dismantle this house and exercise those who've lived there, whose matrilineal scars weakened its foundations and shook its dusty, cracked windows until its inhabitants woke from the dreamless sleep now I want you to have the courage to enter and help me build it a new brick by hopeful brick. Thank you. And this last piece, um, the first piece I read may have um, suggested that I like um, fairy tales or have been inspired by fairy tales. And this one continues in that tradition. It's called Eve's Rib. I watch my mother exhume the doll's house from under a willow tree. She wipes damp soil from its eye sockets and from its eaves rib. Handing them to me, she tells me it's the sister she couldn't carry to term, that I must now learn how to stretch skin over its growing limbs, pull hair from my scalp to seed the roots in the skull's softness. She cups my cheek in her palm's jigsaw, bone created from bone, and I can only nod silently, reaching out to open the nursery door. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks, Susan. Good stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Um, our next reader is uh, it's welcome back to, to um, Steve Mingle. Hi, everybody. Yes, there we go. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I've been struggling actually to find stuff this month. Um, so in absolute desperation, I, did, I decided to write a poem about myself, um, which is not something I particularly like to do, but needs must. Um, now, we're all largely defined by the things that we've done, but we can also be defined by the things that we haven't done. And I'm sure many of you uh, will have played the game I Have Never um which after a few drinks with friends which can often di disintegrate into sordid tales of drunken debauchery uh and, and basically in this game you score a point if you can state something that you have never done which everybody else in the group has done uh so if you're going to be a world-class performer at i have never uh you need to have led a very sheltered life uh and have, uh, have been a, a clean living 
law-abiding model citizen with, with no deviant tendencies. Uh, so here I am. This is called, I have never. I'll try anything once, you hear people say, but I don't seem to be wired that way. And when folk implore, come on, give it a go, it just makes me even more determined to say no. I've never done a bungee or a parachute jump. I've never indulged in a sex act with a petrol pump. I've never tried to assassinate Donald Trump, although I'm a bit surprised nobody else has had a go. I've never tried to suffocate myself with a polythene bag. I've never gone up to a policewoman and said, fancy a shag? I've never smoked a cigarette, not even one drag. I've never gone to a fancy dress party as Julius Caesar. I've never danced on a table. I'm not that sort of geezer. I've never butchered a family member, then cut them into pieces and hid them in a freezer. And I certainly haven't then bagged them up and buried them under the patio. You'd never get away with that where I live. I tell you, bloody neighbourhood watch busybodies. I've never been described as lithe or petite. I've never been an extra in Coronation Street. I've never posted a Facebook message or written a tweet. I've never downed a large, large scotch in a single glug. I've never given Boris Johnson a heartfelt hug. I've never taken any kind of recreational drug. No weed, no speed, not a sniff, not even a spliff, absolutely nothing. I've never walked a tightrope over Niagara Falls. I've never gone to a wedding dressed in overalls. I've never had electrodes attached to me balls. I've never been part of a male voice choir. I've never garroted a stranger with chicken wire. I've never accidentally set my house on fire. Though I did have a bloody good try once actually with a paraffin heater, made a right mess in my bedroom. My Roxy Music fan club newsletters were irreparably damaged. I've never been impressed by folk with money. I've never believed in the Easter Bunny. I've never found Russell Brand remotely funny. I've never been mistaken for a member of T-Rex. I've never used an emoji in an email or text. And here's a good one. I've never had sex with a goat. Seriously, I haven't. People never believe me on this, but I don't actually find them that attractive. You'll never find me sneaking out of a meeting of Goat Shaggers Anonymous, looking a bit sheepish. I've never had a piercing or a tattoo. I've never trusted a politician of any hue. I've never dressed up as Danny LaRue. Well, not intentionally anyway, though I did have some pretty dodgy clobber back in the day. I've never done a karaoke version of Jake the Peg. I've had a few sports injuries, but I've never broken my leg. I've never eaten an omelette or a scotch egg though I have had a few substantial meals, as you can probably imagine. I've never been on holiday to the Philippines. I've never been on stage with the Libertines. I've never wore a necklace made out of sardines. I've never loitered with intent outside public latrines. I've never immersed myself in a bath of baked beans. And here's the best one. I've never worn jeans. Now, how fucking weird is that? Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I, I'd like to believe you there, but I can't. Not an all of them, anyway. All true, mate. All true. <laughs> I can believe you didn't smoke and not smoke, too. That's my... <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. OK, I think we've got three readers. We've got um, uh, four people to go. Um, we've got Reggie coming up next, and then Mary Cunningham, and then Tom. Um, and then and then John Campbell is going to finish it off, us off. That's it, isn't it? But there's nobody else, nobody else lurking around in the ether. Okay, brilliant. All right, then, excellent. Uh, next up is um, is Reggie, Reggie Agula. Welcome, Hi. back. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go. Okay. Um... So this is called To Live is to Kill. And I think this came from the workshop that I do with Andy and Amanda. I think it's based on a poem by Lana Del Rey. Is that it? You know that? All right. So this is called To Live is to Kill. Loss and love, birth and joy. To live is to kill tiny pieces of you. Shedding layers of, scar of scars. Chiseling the model of a better you. Gain and despair death and dismay. To live is to kill all that you knew yesterday. The knowledge is useless and not applicable to you today. Shutting doors, opening gates, roaming free. To live is to kill because without death, 
there's no space for something new. Drink. <laughs> I'm a bit serious. All right, next one. Uh, so this was the title called, wait, 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 okay. This is called Crazy in the Pits. But it's not going to be that crazy. Well, here, it's called Crazy in the Pits. So in the pits, things get dark. Light evaporates. Air is sparse. Every breath feels like feels heavy and carried and moist. Sounds vanish. The willows are muted. Life outside is shut. The only sound is my heart beating, and that is the only certainty that I am still alive. The earth around the pits blend with the darkness and physical space is detached. I stretched stretch my hands out to touch the dirt all in vain my hands wave in the air only the ground keeps me floating i close my eyes and try to imagine the outside a gush of cold air brushes past my back i see you you are just a white veil water drops from above it's raining the pit is filling with water my feet hold me down as i try to swim up i push and push and push and the water holds me down. I am sucked down to the bottom of the pits and then pushed up, sucked out and in the light. Slapped in the back, I cry as I gasp for, for air. Crazy in the pits, also known as birth. Cheers. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thanks, Reggie. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, our next reader is uh, and writer is uh, is Mary coming in. Welcome, Mary. Sorry, I feel a bit of a fraud, guys. I don't think I should do tonight. I've not even participated. I was on a course. Sorry, I was just joining in to listen. You guys crack on. I feel like I can't just turn just up. Just Are you sure? Because um, you come to the live nights as well, don't you? You know, it's not yeah, no, but no, no. Let, let it go, and I'll, I'll just listen and enjoy because it's I've not been here for most of the night. No worries. All right, cool. Okay, good to see you. Um, okay, our next, um, we've got two guys who are new to speak easy, or new, at least new to me anyway. I know I missed a couple before Christmas because of work, but um, yeah, our next um, our next uh, writer is from, um, is, I believe from London, and it's a big welcome to Tom, uh, Tom McCall. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, yep, so I'm gonna read, um, Three short poems from my book, Grenade Genie, which is uh, published by Flying the Wall Press, Manchester publisher, and was mm. featured on Andy's uh, spoken label last year. So thanks very much to Andy for that. And um, yeah, in celebration of us coming out of lockdown and shopping again, I'm going to read this poem first. And this poem is called Jackpot. Here I am at Oxford Circus Station once again allowing myself to be part of the human jackpot that's released each time a train pulls in. I don't know if anyone else ever thinks this, but whenever I'm on a train that's entering this station and I'm watching the branded posters on the platform wall whiz past my carriage window, I'm reminded of playing a slot machine. Okay, this one is a single horizontal spinning drum instead of the usual vertical three, but it's not like the odds are stacked anymore in my favor. The trains come to a stop my carriage window reveals a mixed line, Gap Kids, Nike Air, and the Oxford Circus Roundel sign. Whatever the combination though, I'll never win. It's Oxford Street that always wins the prize, with today being no exception. The carriage empties, and every other carriage is emptying too, as shoppers flow like coins from every exit of the train. What else can we do at this stop, when we've all been programmed since birth to have nothing else but shopping on the brain? Thank you. And, uh, and because through lockdown, I haven't seen people as much to the point that I'm starting to forget people's names, I'll read this poem next. It's called Jan, Jen or Jean. I hadn't seen her in years. Her name was Jan, Jen or Jean. I couldn't remember which. My face lit up like a fruit machine when she caught my glance as we passed each other on Southwark Bridge. Hi, Tom, she said. And as if she pressed play, I felt compelled to take the chance. The names began to spin inside my head. Jan, Jen, Jean. I pressed stop too quickly. I had little choice and settled on Jean. Hi, Jean, I said. We passed. I pressed collect. I got a sick feeling in my gut. 
as the name Jan for first prize flashed before my eyes. Thank you. That is a true story as well. So, uh, I'm still blushing at the thought of that. <laughs> and the um, and in honour of the NHS that has been here for, there for us throughout this lockdown, I'm going to finish with this poem. And it is called The Surgery I Go To As A Two-Headed Doctor. <laughs> the Surgery I Go To As A Two-Headed Doctor. Dr. Smith will see you, see you now. It gets very confusing. Dr. Smith via his left head gives me a diagnosis. Then via his right head gives me a second opinion, which always differs from the first. And that opinion is never the best one, always the worst. When Dr. Smith examines me with her stethoscope, it's in the left head's left ear and the right head's right ear. In other words, he makes a right pig's ear and also a left pig's ear of any examination he does. However, when I once challenged him about it, Dr. Smith's left head simply said, can you breathe in a bit more deeply, please? While his right head shook morosely. Apparently his wife has got two heads as well and two pairs of breasts. It's said they met as impoverished but physically normal students earning money by undergoing laboratory tests. Two heads are better than one, they say, but I'm not too sure that comes into play while attending an appointment with the always in two minds, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Thanks, John. Yep, good, thanks good luck with the um, good luck with your book. Another good progress you've planned or yeah. Okay, last but by no means least, um, I actually worked with a guy called John Campbell. Uh, so uh, that's a coincidence. He's a little bit of a keyboard warrior, a bit angry and stuff, you know. Gets a lot angry about lots of things. I mean, he's the most mild-mannered, nicest guy you could ever meet, but he's just a maniac on keyboard. So uh, anyway, put that little story aside. Uh, it's a uh, welcome, big welcome. Uh, last but not least, John Campbell. Hi, John. Thanks for the intro, Steve. Um... And thanks, Andy, for uh, for having me. Uh, this is my first speakeasy. Uh, I live in Didsbury, but I'm, uh, I grew up down south. So I've got three poems sort of inspired by nature. The first one's about innocence. It's called Snowdrops. John, then, can you with me a sec, please? John? Just, yeah. Just if it, there's quite a bit of background noise, static noise from somewhere. Ah, oh, do you know what? That might be my um, cooling fan. Tell you what, if I get some headphones, oh, really? that might make it better. Um, if you can it just probably, give me... it, probably will, John. That because you just yeah, yeah. can, can you can you give can you can you give me ten seconds to go and get those a second? I'll be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah take your time. Yeah. Right, I tell you what, guys. Then while um, John's getting prepared, then just to remind you, officers, speak easy. Then for next month, just give to say, Cedar's breath is going to be on. Come get my diary out. It's on the 2nd of June, okay? So I'll be taking the bookings as normal from Sunday, from midday onwards. You've all got the details. Give me a shout, okay? You want to be on? Yeah, I think we'll, I think we'll, we'll try to... We've not really talked about it yet, but we'll, I think we should probably try to to sort of get a live gig on in July, but we're going to have to see how it goes, aren't we? I mean, yeah, you know, I think yeah. at the moment it's... Obviously, we can't do it in May at the moment, certainly, so... I think if everyone's wondering, yeah, we're going to have a chat with me, see with Amanda about his next couple of weeks, because like a certain, I certainly like to have it live again, and I think I you know you would, Steve, as well as Amanda would. Yeah, yeah, but I think I just think if it's at the beginning of the month. I think it's probably just a little bit too soon, June, June, June the third, maybe or the fourth or whenever it is. So, I think yeah. it should aim for sort of July, really. I think realistically, yeah. Yeah, and um, anyone's noticed as well, obviously, we, we, um, me and Amanda went past a sip the other day as well, and the sip's now some sort of, a, what was it, Steve, we told you, Steve, an Indian meeting room, was it now? I I'm not sure. I, I know, yeah, it isn't so like that it was. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think we're just going to have to look at a new a new venue around and about, aren't we, Stratford slash Jordan, really. Yeah. And for Dan to Roy's question on there, it definitely won't be at the same venue because, like I said, it's, it's now an Indian meeting room, <laughs> so I'm not going to yeah, get away. It's, it's not going really anymore, though. It's not, we're going to have to find somewhere else. Yeah. Already. Okay. You're ready, John. Go for it. Is okay, that... well, that's, that's a sort of, that's, that's a sort of end, end of show announcements, I think, isn't it? Before the show has ended. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Okay. Is is that better, okay, by the way? Okay. No less interference? Miles better, mate. Great, okay. So this yeah, is called Snowdrops. Yeah. Then, 
there were drops of snow. White fire, a bush among all that mess and tangle. They came before shame and connotation. Seeds without the movement of love, without the need for intent. Surrender your noise. Sit in their vacuum, cold, fast plunged into water. These bulbs grew on the moon after Armstrong's dust had settled. The thing is done. There are no more things that should be done. The doing of things, the hunger, the eating and the doing, the doing of things is noise and lust. This bomb goes off to give its tight explosion in reverence for that falling dust. Child, barefoot through the forest, let her wander and pass. Bamboo shrine, cold mist. Here she comes, this small petal circling in the great pooly abyss, in the darkness between the ribcage, empty with fire. Cut adrift from the shuttle, growing in space, where all this light might just grow. Uh, this next one is about fish. <laughs> it's called Koi. The child of want, tired in the overgrown forest, deep in thick rhododendron, stopped hacking and turned to the pond. Precision came along, clearly folded into a coy line, slow and golden, yama, buki, ogun, and all that clear black water. And lastly, this was my audition piece for, for a slot. Um, this, is, this is a, I have been known to enjoy some wild swimming, so this is about wild swimming, um, or not wild swimming, in fact. I came down through winds voiced in broken branches and movements which could bring man to his knees. Pushing on across the ridge, I turned to let the howling go and the beating chest, and the outstretched arms, and I headed down through the Irwood to the reservoir. Once, here, in this place, I had plunged into the water, black and brown undercurrents pulling at my feet, lost in rusty darkness. Once, here, cold blood churning through the pump house, I swam deep to the shore of my redemption and the fire next to the skin. This time I sat on the bank, shoulders casting a certain stone. This time I sat on the bank, following the ripples. This time I sat on the bank, watching the form fade into bees and breath and away from all those rhododendrons tangled under the water. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. And quite a sort of measured, soothing uh, influence to and tone to end the night. And hopefully, see you in the, when we get cracking again in yes, please. Charlton Stratford, you know. <laughs> so we have a Facebook page, guys. Um, Troll Speak Easy. And um, you know, so follow us, you know, for, you know, um, and yeah, just watch his space really in terms of live performance. And as Andy said, his usual arrangements, um, email him um, for a slot in, um, in the next month. Okay. So look after yourself, stay safe. Okay. And um, see you soon. Cheers. It's been lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night.